Good evening, colleagues. Good evening, Professor Balfour. Good evening, uh, Professor Drummond, Professor um, Francois van der Westeisen, Professor Tebe Madupi, uh, Deanery and the DVC. Uh, good evening, distinguished guests and friends, directors, colleagues. Uh, Professor James, it's really a great privilege tonight to uh, be here and to share in the joy of this wonderful occasion. And tonight, as we celebrate this wonderful occasion, I would like to just open tonight and uh, share a few thoughts about the concept of ambition. Uh, I would like to let us think together a little bit about ambition. What is ambition and should we be ambitious and what is the right kind of ambition to cultivate? Now, as you all know, ambition is the strong desire to do or achieve something. And I think we have a beautiful example tonight of somebody who has achieved a lot in his, uh, should I say, relatively short lifetime, Prof. James. And uh, we are hoping for much, much more and bright and wonderful and illustrious things coming from you. Ambition is a strong and motivating force, a driving energy and an enthusiasm or zeal to make a difference, to stand out, to leave a mark, to contribute to society and to impact lives. And one can even define ambition as the thought process or mindset that precedes the actual deeds or the achievements of a person. Napoleon Bonaparte said that the truest wisdom is a resolute determination. Now it's a good thing to be persistent and focus and zealously follow one's dreams and beliefs. However, we know that sometimes the most enduring victories are oftentimes spiritual since they are timeless and lasting. If we turn to the book of Proverbs, uh, we see that this indicates, this verse I'm going to read, indicates a contrast between different types of victories that may result from different seeds of the different types of ambition that one can find. Let me read from Proverbs 16.32. Better be a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. 
Furthermore, verse 1 of chapter 16 reads, The plans and reflections of the heart belong to man, but the wise answer of the tongue is from the Lord. An outward display of prowess, strength, and power may be impressive and may yield admirable results. But who can conquer the depths of the inward life from which a lasting legacy may spring? For this we need the aid and the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 5 and 6, For those who are living according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those who are living according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit, His will and His purpose. Now the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God, both now and forever. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul writes about his ambition to be a disciplined spiritual example to all and a worthy representative of the gospel which he proclaimed. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what it should. Training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching for others, I myself might be disqualified. An inspiring example, a selfless attitude of service to one's fellow man, investing of one's character and one's time into others. These things will outlast many earthly ambitions. Alexander the Great said, When my casket is being carried to the grave, leave my hands hanging out. For empty-handed I came into this world, and empty-handed I shall go. My whole life has been a hollow waste, a futile exercise for no one at death can take anything with them. We have seen counterexamples of a good ambition and a futile ambition, about temporary legacy and a lasting legacy. Let us consider tonight our own ambitions and our activities in the light of eternity. The secret, I believe, is not only to have focused ambitions and dreams, but to refine one's ambitions so that they will be aligned with God's ambition for one's life. Let me end with Proverbs 16 and 3. Roll your works upon the Lord, commit and trust them wholly to him. He will cause your thoughts to become agreeable to his will. And so shall your plans be established and succeed. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We are so blessed that we can celebrate with a colleague a wonderful um, highlight in his career and in his life. Thank you for the blessings, for the talents, for the opportunities that you have given and bestowed upon him. Thank you for the good ambition that he has in his heart and that he is following and that he is making a difference using all of the things that you've given to him. That is his gift back to you. Bless us all and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is François van der Westhuizen, and it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you tonight, officially welcome you tonight. Uh, it's a, particular, a particularly pleasant and special uh, uh, occasion for me also, as I had a front seat uh, to James's career at the Northwest University and his meteoric rise, pun intended. Um, so, uh, recognizing uh, the following distinguished guests and functionaries present here uh, tonight and online. Um, first of all, Prof. James, I can't see you. Are you yeah, there? You are right. First of all, it's your evening tonight, so welcome to you, especially in your family. Come to them later. Professor Robert Balfour, uh, the DVC for Teaching and Learning of the Northwest University. Thanks very much for your attendance tonight. It's special for us as a faculty to have you here tonight. Then uh, our host for the night, Professor Helen Drummond, who is the acting executive uh, dean for the, our faculty of natural and agricultural sciences. Welcome to you as well. Then Professor Terbe Medupi, uh, the deputy dean for assigned functions. 
um, welcome to you also tonight. Then there are other members of the faculty management uh, here also present tonight and dignitaries in the procession that I would like to uh, welcome, especially Professor Christoph Fenter, who just opened for us, who is the director of the Center for Space Research. Christo, welcome to you. Um, Prof. Stefan Ferreira, the former director and the current director of, of the National Astrophysics and Space Science Program. Uh, Stefan, welcome to you uh, also. Then another director from the faculty, all the way from Afikeng campus, Prof. Olubukolo Babalola. She's the di director uh, of the research entity for food safety and security. There you are, good, good evening to you as well. Then a uh, number of colleagues, they on the right uh, of physics, um, Prof. Amare Abebe, Prof. Ilani Loebser, and then Prof. Tetui Strauss. Welcome to you, um, colleagues. Um, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is indeed a, a very special and memorable occasion uh, for someone, someone like Prof. James, who has this unique opportunity to be inaugurated as a full professor. Um, and indeed, it's also for his close colleagues and his family. The, an inauguration to a full professor is a, one, an, a unique occasion in one's lifetime academic career, uh, but also a time that makes you pause and think of the people that have shared uh, the time uh, along with you in your whole path, in your from school times up to the point you, where you are now. And in that regard, um, James asked me to, to give a special welcome to a number of family members and friends uh, who are here tonight, but also online present. So firstly, um, his wife, Mrs. Okuchukwe Chubwetse. Um, can I, you are there. Thank you, good, good evening. And their children, uh, James Jr. and Sophia. I'm not sure if they will be able to <laughs> recognize the welcoming. Um, then I believe your mother is online, James. Uh, his, his mother is Patience Chubwetsi. Uh, welcome to her, especially. I'm sure she's also excited to be online present here. His five brothers, who are also uh, listening in online, especially his elder brother, Emmanuel Chubwetsi. A uh, special welcome to him. His uncles, also online, Mr. Godwin Okbonaya and Mr. Ndubuisi Agwu. Um, I'm sure they, they're online and they're probably also dressed up for the evening. James, I think you and your mother should check on, on the family members tonight and see if they indeed have dressed up for you, even though they're online. Then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Consul General of Nigeria, His Excellency, Excellency Mr. Malik Ahmed Abdul is represented here tonight in person by the Vice Consul Honorable Mr. Ehyabi Erhatse. Um, can I just see where he is? A special welcome to you, sir. Then Mr. and Mrs. Modest Onyedire, representing the 2000 class of Abia State Senior Science School of Nigeria. James asked me to, I can see just they are there. Uh, and then Professor Obachukwu and Professor Chukwude from the University of Nigeria, both are online tonight, listening in here. Then finally, Mrs. Veronica Mohapelua from the Department of Science and Innovation. James asked also to, to, to welcome you, especially. Is she online or present here? Good evening and welcome to you as well. So then there are a number of colleagues uh, here present tonight and friends here uh, present here and, and online. A very warm welcome to all of you here. I believe you share with me uh, 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 the heartfelt appreciation of, and happiness for this occasion with James tonight and what he has achieved uh, thus far and that we are also want to celebrate this special occasion with him. Uh, with that, I, I end the welcoming and ask Professor Drummond to... Um, to introduce the speaker tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce um, 
Prof. James Trebrezi to you. And I think I'm going to call him up to stand here so that we can see his beautiful face while I do that. Thank you. Uh, James Triberese is the second of six sons of Patience and the late Henry Triberese Ubenaya. I take my hat off to her. He obtained his BSc in Physics First Class and MSc in Astrophysics degrees from the University of Nigeria and Tsuka and proceeded to Kagoshima University, Japan for a PhD under the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology in 2009. He completed and received his PhD in radio astronomy and astrophysics in 2013. He joined the East Asian Alma Regional Center at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan as a project research fellow and a year later as project assistant professor. In 2015, he returned to the University of Nigeria as a lecturer. He joined the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, Serao, in 2017, and he was in the same year appointed extraordinary senior lecturer at NWU, and he fully joined NWU as an associate professor in 2019. James leads the Radio Astronomy Research Group of the Center for Space Research. He has graduated one PhD and four MSc students and supervised six BSc honors projects as well. He is leading a project to acquire, install, and operate a four-element radio interferometer at Neutgedacht, strategically funded by NWU. And this is a demonstration of his commitment towards growing the critical mass of radio astronomers in South Africa, who will be the users of the Meerkat telescope and the square kilometer array. He has authored 55 peer-reviewed re articles, including one in Nature as a lead author, and obtained an NRFC rating in 2020. He has received many awards and grants, including the Italy-South Africa Joint Research Program grant funded by the NRF. James is currently a member of the Sarao Users Committee overseeing the operations of the observatory. He is a member of the Science Committee of the African Astronomical Society, the International Astronomical Union, South African Institute of Physics, Astronomical Society of Japan, Royal Astronomical Society, Astronomical Society of Nigeria, and the American Astronomical Society. He has served as proposal review panel member for several world-class astronomical observ observatories. In addition, he has acted as an external examiner for several masters and PhD degrees, chairing the External Examination Committee for one PhD at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. He is a reviewer for international journals like Nature Astronomy, Astrophysical Journal, Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, Astronomy and Astrophysics, and publications of the Astro Astronomical Society of Japan. His hobbies include spending quality time with his lovely wife, Oguchuku, and children, traveling, soccer, reading, and DIY projects, a man of many talents. So it is my privilege now to give you your robe and then hand over to you. Thank you. 
Good evening, everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to stand before you. Uh, first of all, to thank you for coming to join me in this special location and also to listen to what I have done over the years and a, a little bit of uh, what I think will be exciting to you. But before then, I would like to um, thank uh, the DVC Teaching and Learning, Professor Balfour, and our acting uh, faculty dean. Thank you very much, ma'am. And the um, deputy dean for uh, community engagement and deputy dean for research and innovation, um, and also all the distinguished um, guests and friends and family, as well as uh, those who are joined online and distinguished guests coming from the Nigerian Council. I would like to go straight and show you a few things about how stars are formed. I have chosen a topic which I think will be catchy for you, the mystery of star beds revealed. I'm not going to show you all the things, but I would try to explain in details all the things I've included. But first of all, I would like to dedicate the talk to my late dad, um, the main reason being because he is the one who taught me to persevere when things are very difficult, and he also taught me that diligence is crucial for survival in life. He always had that sentence, the only road to success is hard work. So I would like to acknowledge him. So now to the main talk. This is our host galaxy, what you see on the screen. That is the Milky Way where we live. We live at the tip of the Milky Way. If you turn it around like a circular disk, our home is close to the tip of the disk. But one of the key things you would see is dark patches all over the place. But I want to tell you, first of all, that galaxy, our universe, especially our galaxy is made up of gas, dust. The dust are essentially carbonates and silicate material. And stars, which are made up of these two materials, uh, it could be early stage stars, um, middle age stars like our sun, or late type stars, which are stars that have exhausted their hydrogen reserve and are proceeding to die. And then dead stars, like what you hear about supernova remnant, explosions that lead to the end of the life of a massive star. So those are part of the constituents of um, Milky Way. We also have star clusters right there in that image you see. And we have supermassive black hole, which is in the middle of our Milky Way. However, if you pay attention to the dark patches, the key question would be, what are they? Um, and is it possible for us to peer behind the dark patches and see what is on the other side? What you see as dark patches are actually dense clouds of dust and gas. And behind it is a lot of other things. Imagine that you're driving your car behind a rickety car that is chunking out a huge black smoke. It would be impossible for you to see further behind, uh, further in front of the vehicle. This is because the thick smoke is going to absorb all the light reflected by objects ahead and therefore impedes your visibility. That's the situation we have there. But I'm going to tell you, we have a workaround for it, for it so don't worry. That brings us to the fundamentals. I, I know that we are not all astronomers. There are people from the public. There are also people from the political class. So I want to show a few things about the emission I'm going to explain today. It will be dominantly radio waves. The first one is the electromagnetic spectrum, which runs from the radio waves all the way to very short wavelength. The wavelength is the distance a transverse wave would travel uh, when it makes a complete cycle. So one cycle could be this way, the second cycle is, half of the cycle is this way, if you pull it together, it's a complete cycle. So that's the wavelength. The, the higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength you will find. So we'll focus more on the radio side of things. Now, when you pick up your cell phone, each time you receive a phone call, it's, it's radio waves traveling to some transmitter to identify you and then to you from the caller. And when you speak, that is the same process. It's go, it goes back and forth. Don't wonder why you get it in real time. The reason is because the speed at which these waves move is ridiculously fast. It can go 300,000 kilometers every second. So even if you're in Johannesburg and I speak to you because radio waves can move that fast, it will 
become like real time. Now the emissions I'll be showing you today will be of two kinds, and one of them is continuous emission, which we call continuum, and the second one is spectral line, which I will explain later. For the continuum, it covers a broad wavelength or a broad frequency band. And one of those is what we call black body radiation, which happens as a result of the temperature of a body. If a body is warm, then it's going to give out waves. And that is the image you see on the top right. Um, the yellow part is what you will see of the black body emission from a human body, which is about 37 degrees Celsius. That is equivalent to 310 Kelvin. There is another kind of emission, which we call the free-free emission. Imagine you have a hydrogen atom, which is made up of one proton and one electron, and you heat it up so much that you break it into two. And you have the positively charged ion one place, which is typically more massive than the electrons, which revolves around the proton. If you break it into two, and the electron, which is less massive, moves typically fast and comes close to the proton, then it's going to try to attract it. Remember, negative, positive will attract. So the change in the energy, I'm going to just show you the animation, that the deflection leads to release of energy. That is called free-free emission or Bremsstrahlung emission, and some of the results I will show you, the emission comes from this kind of process. The third one, which I will show you, is uh, non-thermal emission emission that has nothing to do with the temperature of the body. It is mostly because there is a particle, especially electrons, that move at speed very close to the speed of light. And it gets coupled in magnetic field, and that motion will create emission of synchrotron radiation. So these three types of emission are what I'll be showing you. We pick up with the radio telescope, and I'll show you images we make out of that. The second type of emission I'll show you are the spectral line. These kind of emission come out of specific frequencies. Imagine you pick up water molecule and heat it up, and you allow, remember water is H2O, so which means two atoms of hydrogen bonded to one atom of oxygen, it could vibrate. So this vibration or rotation about the axis of this bonding leads to emission. So that's spectral line, and it has specific frequency. One of the most common spectral line we know is called neutral hydrogen line. It occurs at 21 centimeters, which is equivalent to 1.42 gigahertz in frequency. And that's what you see on this side. So typically you have in hydrogen atom, the proton and the electron um, coupled together and the electron moves around its orbit, they move, the spin direction is usually the same, but if you excite hydrogen, that could lead to the change in the spin direction of the electron, so it spins in the opposite direction. This gives out radiation at exactly 21 centimeters, and those are hydrogen lines. There is another one, which we call the masers. Masers are microwave equivalent of lasers. Uh, what I've got here is a laser pointer. If I point it on the wall or point it on the screen, you could see it from any angle. This is light. You amplify light, and you can send it as far as you want. Okay. So in the case of this, we're talking about microwaves, which means you need to amplify microwave emission, and it's typically achieved by what we call population inversion. Population inversion is just is a process where you send the particles in a molecule to a higher energy level. And then you send in an incident photon that will trigger those, uh, highly, uh, those electrons at high energy levels to come down to lower energy levels. OK, so this is to put it in an easy way. I'm going to be speaking about masers, which is population inversion excited. I would not speak a lot about neutral hydrogen. I'll mention a few other molecules. I'll also speak about continuum emission. And the results I will show you today is taken from telescopes scattered all over the world. The first few ones are the VLBI telescope. VLBI means very long baseline interferometry. I will explain that in a moment. 
And I'll show, of course, uh, some results with uh, the Miaka telescope here in South Africa in the Karoo Desert in Carnarvon. And I'll show one just very close to us, Hadbis 2 26 meter radio telescope. I'll show results from Alma telescope in Chile and the very large array in Socorro in uh, New Mexico State in the US. And then the VLBI in the US um, have got telescope all over the place and also the submillimeter array in Hawaii. There will be a few results from space telescopes and I'll show you why this is important because we need to see infrared emission. What is interferometry? Um, our eyes is our telescopes. We can see with it, we can pick up optical emission. So if you consider the eye, um, the resolution, how much detail you can see with any telescope, whether the eyes or your small optical telescope or a radio telescope is a function of the wavelength divided by the size of your telescope, the diameter of the dish. Our pupil is one millimeter, so you would be able to um, get an angular resolution of two arc minutes. Don't worry, that is difficult to understand. Two arc minutes is equivalent to two times one degree divided by 3,600. Just leave the maths. If you take a degree and you divide it, you remember one degree is this tiny angle, divide it into 3,600 places, that would be one arc second one arc seconds, and then you multiply by 60 and multiply by two. Okay. So, in radio, it is very, very difficult for us to get high angular resolution because the wavelength is very long. It makes theta very big. So we need to make the diameter of the dish to be very large to compensate for the long wave wavelength at which we observe. Just give me a second. Um, okay. okay, so what we do in radio astronomy is instead of building very massive dishes, which is now technologically impossible, we build small dishes, spread it over a large distance, and use them to simultaneously observe the same source in the sky. With that, we can compensate for the large size of D, and it becomes the baseline. And that is illustrated in this image shown here. Actually, the largest single stereo dish we have is only 104 meters in diameter. That is quite huge, but it's still very small for the resolution we want. So um, Robert La Ryle brought up this Nobel Prize winning technique, which we call interferometry, where we combine many, many dishes, put it across, across many distances apart, and we can get high resolution. Good, now you can breathe out. The technical part is gone. Hoping you have understood a few of the techniques, and if the emission technique and the radio astronomy technique that I'll be applying in showing you the results you see today. Now here is the last thing I'll bother you with that are technical. I'll be using terms like parsec. I will say one parsec, it simply means 3.26 light years. One light year is the distance light will travel moving at the speed of 300,000 kilometers every second for one year. That's one light year, okay? So one parsec is 3.26 of that distance. And then I'll mention speed of light. I have said that before. It's simply frequency at which you observe multiplied by the wavelength. So you can very easily derive any of the two. So don't panic when I use wavelength or use frequency. I'm simply dividing speed of light by the other. And then I'll use terms like astronomical unit. Um, one AU is equivalent to 149.6 billion meters, and it is just the average distance between us and the sun. Because we'll be considering stars, and stars are of different types, um, there are some that are extremely big, there are very small ones in terms of the masses, we'll also use one solar mass as a scale to describe other um, stars that are big. One solar mass is equivalent to two times 10 to the power 30 kilograms. That's massive. 
but I will show you soon that it's very, very small in mass. And then the stars that I will be showing you how they are born are typically eight solar masses and above. So if a star gets to eight solar mass, up to 100 or more than 100 if, if it is possible, then that star we describe as a massive star, and I'll show you how they are born and how they die. Okay, here is just a movie to show you the full illustration of what you'll be looking at today. This is an animation showing you how um, a cloud that, is, that has discontinuity in the density distribution is non-homogeneous, will co collapse in its gravity, form filaments, I will describe each one of these, and the filaments will fragment into small cores that are extremely dense. Those are the seeds that lead to the formation. And these seeds will continue to accrete at the same time eject material. It's difficult to eat and eat and eat and never stop eating. So when you eat, you have to excrete to keep your stability. Stars do the same. They swallow up a lot of material, they also eject a lot of material, and then they can continue to eat more to grow in their mass. So, why do we need to think about massive stars? Why, why is that necessary? One of the key reasons is because massive stars influence the morphology, both in term, the morphology of a galaxy, their host galaxy, and the chemical composition of the galaxy. If you know any of the solid, uh, the elements, heavy elements that are in the universe, most of them are produced by massive stars. Do you like gold? You probably need a big star in your home. Then um, we have problems studying these stars. There are a couple of difficulties. One of them being that they are typically located very far away from us. Uh, the closest one is 400 parsecs away. Um, 420 parsecs away, which is Orion. The second closest one is 700 parsecs away, and that is Cepheus A. The other ones that we know are more than 1,000 parsecs away. So it's so far away that we need special instruments to be able to resolve the details of how the formation processes occur. Also, the other critical problem is that these stars evolve very quickly. They are very big. They start their birth and they die so fast. By fast, I mean a few million years. You would say that is too long. No, that's not. The age of our sun is of roughly four billion years, and that is enough time for a, star to, a massive star to form die many times over because it lives only for a few million years. So that makes it difficult for us to trace every of the stage of the formation and to build a full picture of how these massive stars form. And I would also want to highlight another difficulty, which is the fact that the massive stars start shining and they continue to accrete material onto themselves. This is a difficulty, I'll explain why. Our sun is no longer collecting hydrogen fuel onto itself. As at the time it starts burning hydrogen, the radiation field is so strong that it blows away every other material that surrounds it during the formation process. And all it can do now is to eat up the hydrogen, use the, fuse the hydrogen to give us light and energy which we receive here on Earth. Massive stars will start burning hydrogen but continues to accrete. We still don't understand why. So the short lifetime of massive star makes it difficult. Um, humans live only 100 years, so we cannot track the lifetime of one star from the beginning to the end. Then how do we learn how massive stars form? We play a puzzle. We can pick pieces of the processes leading to the formation of massive star from different forming stars at different stages of their evolution. So if we go to Orion, we understand what it is doing at the current stage of the formation, we move to another star that is probably younger, and then we can put together these pieces of the puzzle and build a true picture of a holistic way that massive stars form. And that's what we're going to do this evening. 
This is what we know from collection of different puzzles from different stars about how massive stars form. We know that they, they form in filaments um, because that is where the seed materials are generated, which is this clumpy molecular cloud. And the, the next stage of their formation is the most elusive stage, which is uh, the pre-stellar core. The pre-stellar core is when you have this dust condensation that has not gotten enough gas in them. And one example of it is G11.92. I would come to that much later. The next stage will be when the core accretes a lot of gas, have a lot of kinetic processes inside due to collision of the molecules it has accreted, and then it starts molecules that are frozen onto the dust grains. And then the temperature will increase furthermore and it starts ionizing hydrogen. You form what we call um, hypercompact H2 region. It will ionize further to form ultracompact, ionize further to become a classical H2 region. So what I would do this evening is to quickly go from each one of these stages and show you the different stages and the results that we have seen unveiling each of these stages. So we'll start with the first one, the filaments. One of the biggest contribution of an European space mission that is called the Herschel Telescope, which I have put the image on the top right, um, is that it showed us that everywhere within the Milky Way, you find filaments. You find these tiny, very dense, uh, elongated materials um, fill all over our galaxy. One example is this object, which we call the cat pal nebula. You can really see that the, it looks like the pals of a cat. The other name is called NGC6334. This is one of my favorite massive star forming region. If you look at this object with Herschel at um, very short radio wavelengths, with sub-millimeter wavelengths, then what you will find is this image right here. The critical thing you see in this image is the fact that you see long filaments everywhere, like these projected long filaments. And if you zoom into this part, you see these nice long filaments. Also, you will notice the cores, okay, the tiny higher condensations, which we call dense cores. So with Herschel, we understood that most of the massive stars, if not all, form inside filaments. But wait a moment, how do filaments themselves form? We have to explain that, it's part of the puzzle we need to solve. I'll show you a result from uh, 2014 that I did with Japanese colleagues. We looked at an object very close to the center of our galaxy, it is called the bricks. This brick object, um, is dark in the infrared. So if you look at infrared, you see all nice bright emission around it. And then you see this dark uh, arc-shaped morphology. What we did was to look at this object in millimeter molecular line emission with ALMA telescope. And the results we got is this image. Now this is an image of silicon dioxide Remember I told you molecules give out radiation and the colors astronomers use is just to show the variation in the intensities. Sometimes we also use colors to represent the velocity structures, how the gas is moving. So in this image what you see is a nice, um, this is the integrated intensity. If you put the intensities of the emission all together, you get, you reproduce this nice arc shape morphology. But why does this have this shape? Well, you may want to look at the velocity structures. The two images on the right-hand side show you the velocity and the velocity dispersion of silicon dioxide. And if you focus your attention around the inner part of the arc, you will see that it does have significantly higher velocity dispersion. So this is a filament. We have evidence that there are, there are stars forming in it, but it does have a morphology we need to investigate how that forms, and that will give us a clue into how you produce filaments. 
Now have a look at this simulation. Imagine you have two clouds colliding with each other, then you would see nice high density region produced in the middle. So we know cloud-cloud collision from simulation can actually pr produce filaments. But how can it produce a filament with a C shape? We got um, a few theoretical physicists in Japan to run a simulation to try to collide a small cloud and a big cloud together. So you bring them, one runs into each other, as you see in these panels, and you can reproduce nicely the arc shape we see in the observations I showed you earlier on. So if you, uh, the panels you see there just splits uh, the simulation stages into small different time snapshots. So with cloud-cloud collision of a small cloud and a big one, you can reproduce the morphology we see in the observations. So you can directly attribute formation of filaments to collision of small clouds within the giant molecular cloud. One piece, success. Good. So we go to the next piece. Now we know how filaments are formed. Of course, I have not explained the parts that magnetic field plays, but I will come to that subsequently in other talks. But we go to the next stage where I have never been able to see one of these kind of cores. But happily, my collaborator, Siganowski, uh, Claudia, was able to detect one of it in 2014. And this is the pre-stellar massive core. So the pre-stellar core means there is no star in it yet, but the core is dense and massive enough and is likely going to form a massive star. And that is one, the only example that I know of pre-stellar cores. The reason we don't have too many evidence of pre-stellar core is because they evolve very quickly. We suspect it could be within a few years for it to move from pre-stellar core to a hot core phase. Um, so we don't have many examples of this. Then we go to the interesting part. This is the hot molecular core phase and the phase we call the hypercompact H2 region. The evolution between these two stages is also very quick, so I'm going to combine the description together. And I'll show you one of the most interesting findings um, in recent years, in the past five years, of how massive stars grow in their mass. So we get to that stage now. Um, I have highlighted that this is uh, a work done by my PhD student. He is currently studying uh, G358.46 minus 0 0.39. When I say these numbers, all I am saying is the position of this source in our galaxy. So the first number is the galactic longitude, and the second number is the galactic latitude. So if you just come to our galaxy, find that location, you would point straight at this object. So we looked at this object with ALMA, and we found the white contours you see is the dust emission coming from black body radiation. The gray ones come from meerkats, which is free free emission, as I described earlier. The background is infrared emission. The triangles represent 6.7 gigahertz uh, methanol masers. I would want to mention that these masers are exclusively associated with massive stars. You don't find them in low mass stars. And what you see right here is, if you point ALMA to this and look at the spectral line, you will find a forest of lines associated with the millimeter object we call MM1A, which means that this object is already warm enough to heat up the dust. Remember, the temperatures of this dust is around 20 Kelvin. So it's quite cold. So you need to warm it up to release the gas that is frozen onto the dust grains. So if you're able to detect these molecular line emissions, you are simply looking at um, a warm core that has been able to release some of these molecules from the dust grains. So we see lots of line emission. Um, any chemist person here will be excited to see lots of methanol. SO2, we have uh, methyl cyanide, and a couple of other molecules. However, if you look at MM2, we find a number of lines. MM2 is this object right here. You find a number of lines, but not as many as you find in MM1. 
What could be the reason? Well, one reason could be that the densities, the column densities of the, those gas around this core is smaller than in MM1. The other reason could be, remember we see H2 region, so it means this object may be warmer, okay, or too hot that it dissociates some of those molecules. So um, Jude, who is joining online, is working on this. We have just received the referee report on his paper, and hopefully he can finish it and, and submit. The other thing about this object is that we find outflowing material. If you remember the simulation I showed earlier, at some point, the rotating core, which has a disk, will start ejecting materials from the poles. The disk is in the plane. Imagine you have a disk this direction, and the central star ejects something radially in three dimensions. Because the disk is very thick, it is impossible to see things in the plane, then you see things go out in the poles where you have lower uh, densities. That is why anytime we see a star that is, has a rotating disk, if the disk is in this direction, expect the outflow to be perpendicular to the disk, and that's exactly what we see in this object. So we see the central part, which is the rotation. This is the rotating um, disk structure, and this is the direction of the outflowing material. So that is looking at millimeter lines. What if we look at centimeter emission? Can we use masers to find the kinematics, the motion of the gas in these stars? The answer is yes. And this is the source. Um, I studied, the, my first publication was on this source, so it's also exciting. But we can see it from the southern hemisphere, which is, which is sad. It's called Cepheus A. Um, the observation was done with uh, VLA and VLBA by Torelles, who is my collaborator uh, in Spain. And he observed the water masers, the line emission coming from water. And what you see in this image, the contours are the centimeter emission coming from free free. In this case, there is a jet. I will explain what jets are very soon. And then the color-coded uh, stars and crosses are just positions of the water masers. Now, if you want to study motion, you want to look at any compact object at least more than once. For example, to measure the speed of a car, the speed camera would have to take the image of the car once, take it again, calculate the distance between that point and the time it took to get to that point, and then it will get your speed. We can do the same here. Imagine that the masers are tracing gas motion. Then we need to take images of that masers at least more than three times, at least more than twice. Twice will give you a lot of error, three times will give you a better measurement or more. So if you take snapshot when it's here, you take snapshot when it's there, you know the separation in months or in, in time between these two epochs, you take another snapshot, then you can calculate the velocity and you wish to represent it with a vector, for example. So that's what we do in this object. I'm not going to show you vectors, I'll rather show you an animation. So R6 is a MESA cluster, R7 is a MESA cluster, R8 is a MESA cluster. And when I play the movie, it will change the position of these mesas as we observe it in different epochs, in different time. So that's what you see. You can see the mesa R6 and R8 move away in this direction, but R7 moves in that direction. So what do you see here? Of course, you can calculate the motions. In R7, the motion is much faster. It's moving at 70 kilometers every second. So in two seconds, with the motion of these masers, you will be in Johannesburg from Porchestrum. That's how fast, just two seconds, you, you'll be where you want to get to if it's Joburg. So what we see here is what we describe as a wide angle outflow. Remember, we've taken snapshots of the masers and we see how it moves away and we can connect it with lines and tell you that this object is driving an outflowing gas, and the angle, the opening angle of the outflow is very wide, is about 102 degrees. To explain this, 
Think about the jet in the middle. I told you the white contours here is a jet. That jet is moving much faster. It's moving at 500 kilometers per second. So if you can move as fast as that jet, you'll get to Joburg, come back, go back to Joburg again in one second. So imagine that you stand very close to a, a bullet train. Uh, maybe the Japanese will associate with this more. If you stand a few meters from a bullet train line and it passes, you would feel the wind push you. Even a vehicle, you will always feel that. So we think that the, the motion we see in the wide angle outflow is driven by the jets because the RO7, which in the, is in the axis of the outflow, has significantly higher proper motion, which is 70 kilometers per second. The other ones have only 80, 18 kilometers per second. Okay, now I'll show you the result I got. Um, the other objects, which is HW3D, this is my first PhD result, I was observed in 2019 in the continent. 1995 in the continuum, and there is another observation in 2006, which is roughly a change um, of 10 years. The difference in, is 10 years between the two observations. But what you see in these two objects is a significant change. Originally, it was compact, but now you can see elongated morphology in the free-free emission. The other difference is that the flux, the intensity of the emission, has changed also. One other difference is that the peak position, if you take this peak and plot it on this second observation, it is off the main peak. It is right here where you have the cross. So you can start asking what is happening to this object. Well, one possibility is that this is a jet. So you are seeing only one bright spot in the jet clump. The other possibility is that there is more than one object in the region. The other possibility is that the star itself is moving. If you take the third possibility, the motion of the star will be significantly larger than the motion we know of stars. Stars typically move at between two and five kilometers per second. But the velocity you would calculate uh, that I got is 65 kilometers per second, which is very, very huge for the star to be moving. So the next option is to investigate whether this is just ionized jets, um, or multiplicity of YSOs. YSO is young stellar object. So we do that by looking at the proper motion. The first animation I showed you is how the gas water mazes is moving. This time I'm representing that with arrows. So the length of the arrow shows you the length of the motion or the magnitude of the motion. The arrow is shown by the pointed direction. So what you see is water mazes in this jet if you trace the proper motion, you will have some moving northwest. Remember that if it's in the plane of the sky, your maps west becomes east because you're looking directly vertically upwards. East becomes west, west becomes east, just to explain in simple terms. And around the center, there is a lot of turbulence. You can see with the color codes, you have the red and you have the blue. This is a velocity difference. The Imagine it to be Doppler velocity difference of about 20 kilometers per second. So it shows that there is turbulence in the middle and there is this nice, uh, highly collimated outflow with a very small opening angle of 30 degrees. There is something else. You would see some proper motions right here where I am pointing at moving towards the center. That is something you don't expect. If you're ejecting material, you expect gas to stream outwards, not stream towards the stars. So what we see right there, after um, some strenuous modeling, shows that there are more than one star in this region. So the final answer to the final finding of this result was that there is multiple young stellar objects within this region. Okay, so I have shown you a bit of hot core, which emits millimeters. I've shown you that it could drive outflow, okay? It could eject material and then accrete to grow in mass. But low mass stars do the same. So the key question now is, how do high mass stars gain their tremendous masses? How do they become up to eight times 
the mass of our sun. That is the newest puzzle we have, and I'm going to show you how. These two images show you a brief explanation. It looks complicated, don't worry, I'll make it simple. If you focus on the blue line, this is the accretion rate. So the key point in this image is that the rate at which the massive star swallow up material is not constant. At some point, the accretion rate is small. At some point, it becomes really, really high and comes back again and becomes small again, and then it does this multiple accretion bursts. Those times it becomes high are the times we classify as accretion bursts, and they are represented by the spikes. Each time it spikes, they start swallow up a lot of material, and it also launches jets, goes back to a stable state, and then it repeats that process. Sometimes this can be ridiculously high accretion rates. For example, if you see this spike here, if you draw a line to this place to calculate the accretion rate, it's about half of a solar mass. That is half of the total mass of our sun. And that, that could be accreted within just one year. Remember, the lifetime of a massive star is a few million years, but in one year, there is a possibility it could swallow up half of the sun and then goes back to a lower um, accretion rate. So this simulation came after the discovery you see on the left-hand side. Um, I like this finding, but somehow, sometimes I feel sad that they, they beat us to, it was published in Nature Physics. We got the results, our result I'll show you next at the same time with these results, but they were quicker to publish in Nature Physics. So Garati um, took image of a star and, f and compared it to a previous image taken of the same star. This is infrared K-band image um, taken before the bust, the accretion bust event. And right here is during the accretion bust, and you can see significantly how the intensity of the infrared emission have changed. The other thing is if you look at the outflow lobes, you can see that this outflow has significantly changed. There are other things to see in this image, the holes where you don't see emissions. Okay. Those are actually cavities, and I will show you cavities and show you a recent result of how cavities form. So I'll go back to our own finding, which is on NGC 634 of the accretion bust event. Fortunately, I was studying this source. Uh, I measured the distance to the source to be about 1.3 kiloparsecs. This is with a process we call parallax measurement. It means you have to look at those masers. Remember, I showed you water masers. They are very compact. You use very long baseline interferometer, observe the masers, and you do that multiple times over a year. So you will be able to trace our motion around the sun. So imagine the star is here, and you look at it in July. Okay, let me start from January. If you look at it in January, you will see it on this side. If you go around and look at it six months later, you would see it on this side. So if you look at it in many months, you'll be tracing our motion around the sun, and then you'll be able to derive this angle. This angle, which we call parallax, parallax angle, is equivalent to the height of this sinusoid. Each of the data points taken on each of the observation during the year is the data points plotted right there. So with that, I derived the distance to this source without knowing the source is going to surprise us soon. So we have the distance, and in 2017, there was an observation uh, by my American collaborators. They had observation in 2008 with the submillimeter array, and in 2015, they observed the source again, and the image has significantly changed. The object that changed is actually this object. It has gotten brighter in the dust emission, and if you compare, well, of course, you could say these are two, tel two different telescopes, so you can take the data from one telescope, convolve it, you just reproduce that data with the beam of the other telescope. So if you convolve ALMA's data with the beam of SMA, you produce this image here. So if you compare the two, you can see this emission is quite tiny, and that one and that one remained the same in terms of their brightness, 
but this one has significantly changed. If you actually subtract these two, you will get the SS emission only on this object. So we knew something was happening to that object. Coincidentally, Hadbistook right here is monitoring the mazars frequently associated with this object done by Gordon McLeod. And the observation, this 2015 observation is this line drawn here, and you can see it corresponded with when we saw the mazars associated with this object go significantly higher to thousands of Jansky. Jansky is what astronomers use to measure the intensity of an object or the flux, flux density. So we clearly see that, yes, something is really happening in this object, and we attributed it to accretion bursts. So this is one of the catch, and in this case, uh, the accretion rate was high enough, it could be um, over a quarter of the sun swallowed up in one year at that rate. So that is our, one of our best catches. So we continued to follow up on this. We conducted more observations. Uh, Job, who is my student, participated in this publication. So we found the continuum has a cavity, again, the region where you have low intensities, and we found that there is a jet moving at roughly 100 kilometers per second. And these jets are moving in this direction and corresponds to the direction of the cavity. What is actually a cavity? See this butterfly shape? It is just when you have outflowing material plowing through the dust and gas and clearing the path it plows through. So what you see in the butterfly shape right here is the dust and gas that has been plowed through creating a hollow space within the forming star. And this is a new result which I have just received the referee report which is very favorable. Okay, so we go to the next thing. And that is something that Professor Johan, who is in the audience, uh, this is discovered by South Africans. It's called periodicity of mazars. Mazars that rise and fall as you monitor them over time. Okay, remember if you put a pendulum, you go there and come back, go there and come back. So these mazars go up in their intensity, drop, and go back again, and repeat the process many times over many, many, many years. We, I currently think that the periodicity is an aftermath of accretion burst because in the object I have just shown you, accretion burst was the beginning of mesa excitation in the region that I have just shown you in the previous slide. And this periodicity may be as a result of a process after an accretion burst and the, um, maybe the object trying to restabilize again. Imagine an earthquake. I think Orago, my postdoc from Japan, will associate with this. When you have one heavy earthquake, it comes with aftershocks, okay? So imagine that periodicity are aftershocks of um, very high accretion rates. So one question would be, why do many different stars show different shapes in the light curve of their periodicity? And what causes periodicity? I think Professor Johan will be in a better position to answer that question. But I'll focus on why do we have different light curves. And that is, um, I'll take the result from my PhD student's uh, paper, which was published last year. And she showed in this result that the orientation of the source in the plane of the sky could be the reason we see different effects or different light curve shapes. You can see these two objects show this similar light curve shape and their outflow is in such a way that we can see it nicely in the plane of the sky. But this shows what we call Bunny Hoff shape. It rises, falls, rises again, falls. This other one has a quick rise and a slower decay. But this is just something similar to a cosine function. If you look at the millimeter observation, the background here is a dust continuum the colors represent the gases that are flowing out from the material. So you see the blue is gas moving towards you, the red are gas moving away from you. So what we see in this object is that the object is this way, but the outflowing material is like that, 
facing the observer. So you can see both this side moving away and that side in the same position. But these other two cases are the case where you have it inclined this way. So when you look at it, you can actually see the two arms of the lobes of the outflow. So that was the result Shammari got, um, which, is, which is quite nice, and I, it has been published in 2021. Um, Andrea, who is not here, is looking at whether these are really cosine functions, and I will tell you that it may not really be cosine functions because it doesn't fall and rise immediately. It seems to be a curve. Okay, so we have dealt with this part showing you hot molecular cores, hypercompact H2 region, the outflows, and I've shown you evidence of accretion bursts using observations. I guess the next thing is to show you the ultra-compact H2 regions, which is that part. So with Meerkat, we looked at the entire Milky Way galaxy. Uh, what you see here is Milky Way stretched in a long line, and each of the circles represents the pointing from Meerkat telescope, which is in the Karoo. Excuse me. And Mavis, who is my PhD student, is currently using this um, image to look for H2 regions, which are places where stars are, massive stars are forming, because only massive stars can ionize their hydrogen and emit the free free emission we're looking for. She's found a couple of new ones. I think we have about 30 or 40 that are new that we haven't seen before, which we will show in, in subsequent results. However, I've contributed uh, to a large survey paper where we look at uh, dying stars which is supernova explosions. Meerkat is extremely sensitive. It can detect emission as weak as 15 microjansky per beam. And with that, you can see what VLA is able to do. Uh, this is VLA image in the US compared to Meerkat's image. And you can see Meerkat has better resolution uh, at L band with VLA compared to VLA, and it's much more sensitive. Now, if you zoom into this small patch, this is what you will see from VLA, and that is what you see from Meerkat. What you are seeing as a point with VLA becomes a bubble, and that bubble is one of the youngest supernova explosions that I found in Meerkat data. That is a star that has just exploded in its death process. The important thing about either the expansion of H2 region or the explosion of a dying massive star is that it triggers the formation of new generation of stars. Here, in a paper I published in 2013, this is a cluster of many massive stars releasing a lot of energy and ionizing its environment. The more energy it releases, the more of its environment it ionizes, and that could have mechanical push on giant clouds. It could sweep together gas and dust, collapse it, and start a new generation of formation of stars. This is in the case of H2 region expanding and compressing gas and forming new stars. In this case from Meerkat, the supernova explosion happens here, and there is evidence that there is a HES. Um, HES is high energy observation with the Namibian HES telescope. There's a HES high energy uh, object here, which is as a result of that huge explosion. And here, the blue dots, which are quite tiny, I hope you can see it, are actually younger stars that has been born as a result of that explosion. The red ones are older generation, probably due to the H2 region. So with Meerkat, we can find out more information about supernova explosions, which lead to the formation of the next generation of stars. So from this, there will be compression, new generation of stars will start the same process of filaments, collapse, and get to the time they die again. So, the next time you look up the night sky and you see Orion, remember Orion is currently sitting at this uh, compact H2 region stage. It will possibly live another million, or if one or two million years, and it's going to die in a supernova explosion. 
just remember all the stages that this will go for. It went all the way from small filaments to fragmentation of the filaments to form the um, massive pristellar cores and then to hot molecular cores to ultra compact hypercompact H2 region, then to ultra compact H2 region, and then to classical H2 region, which it is right now. I did oblige a request to show a few things about black holes. So I will stop the story about the formation of stars. I've given you a small array of the different puzzles we have currently. Of course, as we find more puzzles, we piece it together to form um, more, much more better picture of star formation. But this is one of the results I got last year, which I was excited about. The meerkat doesn't have very high resolution, so you can't do a lot in star formation with it. I will just mention the beam size, which is about five arc seconds. That is just too large. Five arc seconds is a space you have more than 200 massive stars forming, so that's huge. But what you can do with low resolution is to look at things that are much, much far away. Then you have finer detail. And this is an example of um, a cluster of galaxies. When they collide, the hot gas in the center of each of the galaxy clusters would produce uh, this kind of structure. This is to reproduce this morphology we see in observations in the X-ray. However, the Meerkat observation will show you where you have synchrotron radiation, I explained synchrotron before, where you have relativistic electron coupled in magnetic field and gives out this radiation. And that's what we colored here in, in purple. So this is emission coming from Meerkat. I'm not going to show you anything about this, which we call the radio relics, but I'll focus on the nature paper results, which is on this galaxy. So the first fascinating thing, when we zoomed into this galaxy in the Meerkat data, after I finish making the images, is that this looks like a galaxy that is launching a jet, but it does have arms that are bent almost 90 degrees. This is strange, because the jets move very fast. Jets are typically thousands of kilometers per second for a galaxy. It moves very, very fast. So to find it bent was very, very strange. Then we decided to investigate. Well, that's not all. You also find these tiny, tiny filaments, which we call double side structures, and I'll explain what it is later on. But before that, I'll show you how magnetic field in radio uh, galaxies, uh, galaxy clusters can form. If you have typical spread of magnetic field lines, and you send a subcluster material into the field line, it is going to compress these magnetic field lines and have regions where you have thicker magnetic field lines, therefore thicker magnetic field strength. And that is what is shown in this simulation by Asai. So what we have in this result is that there is a huge magnetic field layer around here that the jet interacts with, and that bends the jet in the direction of the magnetic field. Here is what the simulation looks like. Oops. I hope. Okay. So if you have magnetic field lines that are compressed by this subcluster material within the merging galaxy cluster, and you have a jet right there, and you launch the jet. So what you're seeing streaming out are relativistic electrons coupled in magnetic field and you would watch it interact with these magnetic field lines. That creates what it tries to create magnetic tension in the field lines, break some of the tension, and this magnetic field would reconnect. So what you call magnetic reconnection is what generates the bending of the jet. So you can reproduce this um, double side structure that we've seen in the simulation. This is just to zoom in and flip it over so you can see the three-dimensional view of the streaming of relativistic electron. And this, the referee of this paper was really amazed by the simulation and he was, he was happy with it. Uh, and it shows for the first time that we can actually use the structure, the spectral structure of radio galaxies to reveal the hidden magnetic field in large-scale structures in the universe. Okay, so 
Um, this is just to show that the, the results have gained traction. Uh, it's been assessed over 3,000 times. It's already cited twice, three times actually now, and uh, has stayed in the 98th percentile of all over 330,000 publications. So the good thing is now we know that if we look at the spectral structures of radio galaxies, we can actually find interactions. We can use it to discover new things. Then we can go and hunt for more. And uh, Yanni, who is here in the audience, did her honors project with me, looking at interesting radio galaxy with meerkat data. This is just the spectral structures showing the evolution of these radio galaxies in terms of their spectra. And Dakalo is doing similar thing, uh, happily, he, he stud, focuses his study on re specific radio galaxies, gets multi-wavelength data from the radio galaxies, and try to fit their spectra energy distribution. And this result, which he obtained, and he was happy about it, has just been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal later. He's also studying this other object from the Miyakad data. So what is next? Um, should, should I just stick to doing research, uh, collaborating with my colleagues, or do some other thing? Well, there is something I'm very much interested in, and that is to, in, to increase the critical mass of radio astronomers in the African continent, especially in South Africa. So I worked before moving here as commissioning scientist of the Miyaka telescope, and this is a telescope paid with the South African uh, tax money of the tone of 4.4 billion rands. It's a 64-dish array located in the de uh, Karoo Desert in Carnarvon. However, July of last year started the construction of the square kilometer array, which would be a 1.9 billion euro uh, project. Half of it will be in South Africa, half of it will be in Australia. And this, will, this is equivalent to 30 billion rands. The key question remains, where are the South African and African users of the Meerkat and the future SKA? What are we going to do? Are we just going to invest a lot of money and human and resources without having many users and let the other people produce the fascinating results that will come from this? That brings me to my next goal, which is to make um, NWU the hub of human capacity development for radio astronomers in the future. We do have um, a project funded by the Northwest University to build four, uh, four element interferometer with four small dishes. This cost about two million rands and it's been constructed in the UK. Uh, the previous image um, shows, I'm not sure why it flies away. Okay, so this is the container in, in Manchester just heading to the seaport. It's fully manufactured now. We're just waiting for it to be shipped and it will be installed in the Neuktadat farm and we will use it to train as many South African and Africans in radio interferometry so they become future scientists who will be using the Miyakat and the SK telescope. I'm just showing pictures of all the construction. And there are a few other things we do in the radio astronomy group, which I lead. I've mentioned Professor Johan takes care of the MESA modeling, uh, working with Lebohang. I also study galaxy clusters. I look at accretion bursts in low mass stars, which is handled by one of my MSc students, Andrew. And recently, Professor Venta has pulled me into the fast radio bus study, which we do multi-wavelength study, both from radio to gamma ray, um, to look at fast radio bus and see what they are. I'm not going into that topic. I also map um, giant molecular clouds. I study late type stars with my Japanese uh, postdoc who is right here today. And in recent times, I've been col collaborating with people from the uni uh, University of California in Berkeley to look for extraterrestrial intelligence. I know this will sound out of the moon, but Remember that the Meerkat and the SKA will be super sensitive. So if there is SETI anywhere, we may likely be able to detect it. And that is a picture of the Radio uh, Astronomy Group of Center for Space Research. And I will stop there and thank my family um, and everyone 
who is here, my mom and my dad, our stand appreciation to Northwest University, I would honestly tell you that I find this to be one of the most conducive environments I've worked in over the years. Uh, of course, I've worked in different places, but I find this place quite conducive. Thank you very much for the opportunity to work here and the opportunity to serve as a professor right here. And to my students, thanks and keep working hard. To all my collaborators, I think we can do much more in the coming years. Uh, I would also like to thank my classmates from the Abia State Senior Science School, uh, the class of 2020. They are awesome people. They are the best of stress relief when, when you have to relax a bit. And here are the people who have funded my research over time, and I would like to extend my appreciation to all of them. I will say a big thank you, and thank you to all of you who are attending in person and those who are online. I will stop there. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor Robert Balfour, and on behalf of the management of the Northwest University, we want to extend a very heartfelt congratulations to Professor James Chibuizi for a really fascinating and insightful account of the birth of stars and the enormous collaboration, continental, global, national collaboration in the development of the of the arrays and the meerkat facilities that we saw that enable this research to happen. Professor James, it's been really a, an insightful occasion, particularly for a person from the social sciences like myself. I had no idea stars could be hungry. And, uh, and I'm sure we are all hungry like the stars tonight. <laughs> um, but it was also um, an opportunity for me to make some notes in terms of really the understanding that you bring to uh, the galaxy, to the universe, to those areas of light and dark which we look at naively in the evenings and think of as somehow static. And I think what you've managed to demonstrate is how dynamic, how alive the galaxy is, how, in fact, um, there is a, not only a movement, but a whole range of scientific knowledge that explains both the trajectories, the, the combustion, the excretion, the accretion, and so on, in terms that enables us, I think, all collectively, the friends, the family, dignitaries assembled this evening, to have an understanding of this passion that drives your work. So thank you very much for sharing that with us this evening. We really appreciate it. We honor you tonight. We honor your family, <coughs> the dignitaries from the consulate, your many colleagues, Prof Drummond and the management team who have supported you over a number of years to enable you to reach this point. We recognize it's a collective, scholarly, and intensively research engagement that needs a sustained support from the university. I mean, it was, it was wonderful to see in the closing slides the many uh, collaborators in the form of postdocs and your own students and your colleagues around you um, who celebrate with you, I think, tonight this passion of yours that we take forward. So I have a, a small gesture on behalf of the university's leadership which I would like to share with you tonight, and we will stand together uh, for that. And, um, and then we will move towards the conclusion of the evening. Thank you.
So Prof. Uh, Tebe Madupe is going to assist with the closing of this function this evening, and then we will have an opportunity to congratulate Professor Chirizi uh, and then enjoy a, a wonderful evening together thereafter. Thank you, colleagues. DVC, Professor Robert Balfour, Acting Executive Dean, uh, Professor Dramont, Deputy Dean, Professor Francois van der Weshezen, distinguished guest, good evening. Um, uh, I would like to, to thank Professor James Chibueze for a very excellent talk that he gave I mean, uh, he talked to us basically, uh, the, uh, the essence of his talk was about, was about answering the question, where do we come from? Star formation is about us human beings understanding the origins of us. And he focuses on massive stars uh, because these massive stars are responsible for making us human beings in particular. If you take a piece of me and yourself you make chemical analysis of it, you'll find carbon, you'll, ca you'll find nitrogen. Those two elements in particular could not have been formed if massive stars did not exist. You know that uh, at the time of the Big Bang, only three elements were made, helium, hydrogen, and lithium. The rest of the elements in the periodic table were generated inside massive stars. Our own stars, our life-giving star, could not generate uh, uh, those kind of elements uh, in its center. We know, for example, that every second our sun is generating helium out of, out of uh, hydrogen. So really, this was a very important uh, lecture that you gave, and I like uh, the way that you, you gave examples of your students doing the work with you. You gave example of your own work, um, and, and also always publishing at very high impact factor journal. So, Thank you very much, Professor Chibueze, a very excellent scholar indeed. We, it's, a, it's such a privilege to have you uh, uh, in, our, in our university. Um, let me not talk too much. This is not about me. Uh, let me just uh, thank the following people um, and, and recognize some of my colleagues. I feel very much at home tonight. I'm a physicist, so it's very hip, hip, great for me to see my colleagues here. Professor Stefan Ferreira, Professor Christoph Enter, Professor Amare Abebe, Professor Derek Smith, very, very w wonderful to see you here. Uh, Professor Smith is from uh, UNISA, and it's really wonderful that he, he came uh, to visit us and celebrate with us tonight. And also Professor Johan van der Waalt, Professor Ilani Lopsta, Lopsa, Lopsa, sorry, uh, Professor um, Dr. Chris from Mahiking, and, uh, and, and uh, thank you very much a lot. Um, I also, of course, want to thank Professor Balfour for the wonderful words of congratulation, Professor Drummond for introducing the speaker, Professor Francois for uh, introducing the whole event tonight, and of course, the family of Professor Chibueze uh, for uh, selflessly sharing him with us. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.